challenge us just for a few minutes from Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> Luke 19. We're reminding ourselves to have the heart of the Lord for souls. And so we want to look at uh, the Savior, who is the greatest soul winner, and how we can be like him. So we're going to read Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, and then we'll uh, look at a, a few principles from the passage, and then we'll go to prayer, all right? Luke chapter 19, verse 1, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. And he could not for the press, because he was little of stature. He ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he is also a son of Abraham. For the, Lord, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage of scripture. We thank you for this man, Zacchaeus, how you worked in his life, how he responded to the message of your truth, and his life was changed because of it. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us have the same heart of Jesus for people like this all across our world and in our community who we can have uh, opportunity to give the gospel, the light of the gospel to, and help us to take these opportunities. We ask you these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We have here the story of Zacchaeus, a story that if you grew up in church that you are very intimately familiar with. You heard it all the time. You probably saw it in your flannel graph. And if you didn't, you probably still are, f still are familiar with this uh, story because it's such a, a, a famous story. It's such a, w an often told story. But we have Zacchaeus, the short man who couldn't see Jesus, so he climbed a tree and Jesus said, come down out of that tree. And it's kind of comical to us. It's humorous to us to, think, to see this whole thing playing out that we have Jesus calling to this man, come down, I'm coming to your house. And the man doesn't, has never met Jesus. And so Jesus knew his name. What an interesting thing. And Jesus knew where he was. Jesus knew his name. He knew what his need was, which is what the Lord knows for each one of us. Uh, but we have this need all throughout our community. We have the, this need among our neighbors. We have it among, among our coworkers, as we've heard some have witnessed to, family members who come and stay. This need is everywhere. And we have to have eyes open and hearts open to give the gospel to people so that we don't miss these opportunities. This is why God has us here. It's the first step of the Great Commission. We have the missions conference coming up in two weeks. This is the first step, is giving out the gospel. Uh, if we don't give out the gospel, we'll never see people be baptized and churches started. If we don't see people be saved and baptized and churches started, then we won't see people being uh, taught to do all that, I've command that God has commanded us to do. And we won't see that reproduction happens. We've got to start with step one, and step one is giving the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, what are some things regarding the Lord Jesus Christ here that we see that show us what we ought to be? We can't save the person as Jesus did, but there are some heart attitudes that Jesus had that we ought to emulate, that ought to be, uh, we, he was an example for us in these ways, and we ought to have his spirit regarding them. The first thing is that, uh, and there's many in this passage you could find, but I'll, we're just going to look at three. The first one is his humility. We could say that Jesus was unassuming. Jesus was unassuming. He was a humble king. Jesus was humble. Are we humble when we come to our perspective of ourselves and our perspective of the lost world? Many times, the thing that gets in the way of us ministering to other people is our pride. It's our pride. My, what I, my agenda, what I have going on here is very important. What I have going on here is very important. Uh, what everybody else who's around is going to think of me is very important. These things are very important. That's how we perceive them in our human minds. But are they more important than a lost soul that is destined for hell? Absolutely not. So the Lord Jesus didn't put himself above somebody who was like Zacchaeus. Even though he was probably head and shoulders above Zacchaeus, physically speaking, he didn't put himself above Zacchaeus in, being, in recognizing that Zacchaeus was a soul who needed Christ. He didn't put 
anybody, any of the others who were following him ahead of Zacchaeus, he said, no, Zacchaeus needs to be introduced to me. So he had his entourage, if you will, those who were close to him, those who he was ministering to, and those were important people to the Lord Jesus. But Zacchaeus was equally important to him because he knew what he needed. As verse 10 tells us, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus Christ went to the lowest person. We over and over see him going to the lowest person. So he went to the woman caught in adultery, didn't he? He went to the woman at the well, didn't he? He went to Zacchaeus, didn't he? All of these people were lowlifes in the Jewish community in one way or another. Zacchaeus wasn't poor. He was wealthy, but he was spurned because of co his cooperation with the Romans, and he was spurned because of his uh, cheating, defrauding of the Jewish people. And so they hated him because of these things, and I probably wouldn't have thought too highly of him either. Uh, but that just goes to show you that he needed something, that he was lost. We think of those who come, we come across our path. I remember, uh, I remember when I was living in Quakertown, I uh, made the mistake of leaving my shed door unlocked, and there was a problem with thievery around there, apparently, because they came and stole half of my tools. Whatever, they could, whatever was valuable that they could carry off was gone. I was robbed twice there. Frustrating. Anyway, they came and took those things, and the police officer came, and my neighbor from across the way came, and he was all upset and all angry. He's a, a lost man. He was all angry. And I wasn't that angry, and he said, you're taking this really well. And I realized I wasn't taking it, well be, what, taking it well because I had such low value on my things. I did, I did not like it that my things were gone. I was very upset about that. But at the same time, I, was, I felt bad for this person who, who in the middle of the night came to steal my things so that they could go resell them somewhere so that they could get their, their latest fix. And I had pity on them because of this, compassion on them because of that. Not that I was a person of great compassion, but the, th the Lord caused those thoughts to run through my mind. This person is, is, is lost. This person doesn't have the Lord. Look at all this person doesn't have that you have in Christ. And they're going to have to rob again in order to get their next fix. And then they're probably going to get caught eventually and end up in jail. What's their life going to be like? Because they don't have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was humble. He was unassuming. He went to the lowest in Zacchaeus, but he also went to the lowest and then he came to each one of us. Jesus Christ recognized that we needed him. And if we ever get to the point where we think, well, I was worthy of Jesus coming to me, but so-and-so isn't, then we've come to a point of far too much pride in our lives. And we're not, we're not copying, we're not imitating the humility of Jesus Christ. We're puffed up in ourselves. We're proud in ourselves. Jesus went to the lowest in Zacchaeus. He went to the lowest when he saved me. Remember the Apostle Paul, someone that we lift up. What did he call himself? The chief of sinners. That's right. He was the chief of sinners. He saw himself as that. And because he saw himself as that, the Apostle Paul was one of the greatest soul winners. See, he had such a humble spirit, such an unassuming spirit about himself that he recognized all my job is in this life is to give the gospel out to other people. And it doesn't matter to whether they're kings or whether they're slaves. He, did, he gave the gospel to both of them. He gave the gospel be before Agrippa and before Felix, and he gave the gospel to Onesimus, Philemon's slave. He gave the gospel to everyone with whom he came in contact because he was a humble man. Remember Jesus, as we see him here, he was doing the will of the Father, wasn't he? He said, I do all the, always those things which please the Father. Notice what the Bible says in verse 10, as Jesus called himself, it says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. What if he had said the Son of God has come to seek and to save that which was lost? Would that have been accurate? Yes, it would have been accurate, but he said the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost because he emphasized his humanity, his coming as a man in this, in this, in this place. This is where, these were Jesus' words. This is what he said. Jesus Christ emphasized his humanity in this, in, in this passage and in dealing with this man Zacchaeus. This is Philippians chapter 2 being borne out before us that Jesus came as a servant. He was made in the likeness of men and took upon him the form of a servant and was obedient unto death. He was humble. If we are too proud to give out the gospel, then we're too proud. If we are giving out the gospel, there's a good chance we have a certain humility about us, a humility like the Lord Jesus had. Jesus was unassuming. He was humble, but he was also unselfish. Jesus was unselfish. Notice what it says in verse 10 again. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man 
is come. He was unselfish. Remember what the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, he was unselfish. He was unselfish. He gave. Jesus came. He came as the son of man. Matthew Henry in his commentary said, Jesus came along on a long journey. It wasn't a short journey for him to come to this earth. It was a long journey. And you can put that in all the different categories you want to of not just the physical distance, but of the journey that he took from the glories of heaven to the cursed earth, the sin-cursed earth. Jesus Christ was unselfish. He focused on others. He noticed Zacchaeus. He ran before Zacchaeus did, verse 4, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. See, Jesus had this all planned out with Zacchaeus. Now, you and I can't necessarily know if somebody's around the corner ahead of us or some we don't know. We know their name. That's not how it works for us today. But we can, as we talked about last time, we can identify certain people that we know need the gospel. People who we work with, people who are related to us, people who we come across and meet at different places in this life. And when we meet them, we say, this person needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we reach out to them with the good news that Christ has. And we can perfectly see some of them be saved. They won't all respond with, uh, for salvation. But we, it's our responsibility to give them the gospel. And if we really have an unselfishness about us, we will share the gospel as Christ did. Jesus knew, by the way, that his effort would be met with scrutiny from the Pharisees. All of his efforts were. They were, he was always met with scrutiny by the Pharisees. By the way, we should be careful when we deal with the Pharisees that we don't compare always the Pharisees to proud, saved people. Okay? The Pharisees were lost people. That's what we need to understand. They were lost people. And so here he's not talking about, uh, I don't know of any saved people. I'm sure there's some out there, but I don't know of anybody, at least not in this church, if I witness to somebody that you would stand against me and scrutinize me for giving the gospel. Would any of you do that? No, you probably would not do that. So I don't think that here we should, we should be careful about applying this to uh, proud Christians, although proud Christians, and we can be proud as Christians, we should be careful not to have the pride of the Pharisees. Uh, but here, Jesus knew he was going to face the scrutiny of lost people, hypocritical scrutiny from lost people who thought that they were better because they wanted to go about establishing their own righteousness and say, well, I'm better than you because I do this, 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 and this. So when Jesus went to minister to this person and to provide his own righteousness for this lost man, they didn't like that because it made them look not so great. They enjoyed that distance between Zacchaeus and themselves. They enjoyed that and they thought, this makes me look righteous. This makes me look like I'm something. This makes everybody on this earth uh, revere me and honor me and all but worship me. And that's what they desired. And so when Jesus came along offering salvation as the one to be worshiped, they hated that. And they hated also him lifting up this person from the mire. Uh, hold your, your place there and look, go back to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Verse 29. This is always going to happen. We're always going to face the scrutiny of the lost crowd. They'll always say, well, there are sinners in the church. They'll always say, well, so-and-so that was a Christian or professing Christian did this and this and this. And you know what? They're right. It does happen. Christian people sin too. And professing Christian people sin too, whether they're saved or lost. And sometimes the worst kind of sins. But because a someone sins in the church, that doesn't mean that that sin doesn't exist outside the church. Do you see how illogical that is? Well, because they did it inside the church, uh, therefore, everybody outside of the church is justified. No, those who are in the church are not somehow uh, God. They're there because they need salvation. They're there because they know what, th they're learning what the right way is. And they know that's where they ought to be, whether they're doing right or wrong. Uh, come to Luke 7, verse 29. All the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So those who had listened to John the Baptist were now listening to Jesus Christ. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So they were not baptized of John the Baptist. 
They had already rejected God's truth when John the Baptist, that evangelist, uh, brought the message of Jesus Christ, and they, re they rejected it. And so when Jesus came along, it was natural for them to reject him too. Uh, by the way, if they reject us, they hated him first. Let us remember that. They rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace, and calling one to another, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. In other words, the children, or those who would be playing in the marketplace, they would, they would uh, uh, pipe a happy tune on their flutes. And they would expect everybody around to be happy because they were piping happy tunes on their flutes. And so that should bring joy. And so they were saying, well, see, we piped this way. This is what we wanted you to do, and you didn't do it. And then we turned around and mourned. We cried, and you didn't do it that way. See, he was, the Lord Jesus was emphasizing and exposing the fickle, mercurial nature of, of people, especially of these Pharisees. At this point over here, we want you to do this. But at this point over here, we want you to do this. And we'll change on a dime and we'll decide that you're doing the wrong thing no matter what you do. If, if uh, you're doing it this way, you're doing it wrong here. If you do it this way over here, well, we've decided that you're doing it wrong here and you should do it this way that we want you to, to do it. Uh, this is the way that the world is when it comes to the gospel. We have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned to you, you have not wept. And he, said, and he gives a, a, an actual illustration of that. He said, John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he hath the devil. So John the Baptist came, what did he eat? Locusts and wild honey, remember that? And they said, oh, he's got a devil. He's strange. He's nuts. He lives out there in the wilderness. He, he's crazy. He's got a devil because he doesn't eat or drink. But the son of man is come eating and drinking. And ye say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber. You're calling him a drunk and you're calling him a, 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 someone who has no control over his appetite because he eats and drinks. So which way do you want it? Do you want me to be like John the Baptist or do you want me to eat and drink like a normal person? But you can't have it both ways. This is the way the, the culture uh, treats those who give the gospel. Verse 34, the son of man is come eating and drinking. You say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine binner, bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. See, Jesus is a friend of sinners, but not a friend of sin. Catch the difference? Uh, he didn't leave the woman at the well in her condition. He didn't leave the woman caught in adultery in her condition. He didn't leave Zacchaeus in his, in his condition. He didn't leave the, la the uh, man with the crippled hand in his condition. He said, go thy way and sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Uh, the Lord came to bring them out of their sin. So a friend of publicans and sinners, yes, but a friend of sin, no. Uh, 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 come back over to Luke chapter 19. Jesus was humble. He was unselfish. And number three, he was full of desire for the lost and dying. We could say he was unrelenting. He was unassuming, he was unselfish, and he was unre unrelenting. Look at verse 10 again. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We know the story of the, uh, that the Lord Jesus gave of the sheep who went out and the shepherd who went out to look for that one lost sheep, and here he compares himself to that again, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. There was no question when it came to the purpose of Jesus Christ, what his purpose was. This is such a great verse. Uh, one one uh, man who was a, a good influence on my, on my life, his name is Tim, uh, back in Pennsylvania. I, I stayed with him, lived with him for a while uh, when I was a, a student pastor at the church. And uh, he, he had two sons who became, uh, two of his three sons became preachers. Uh, shocker, but this was his favorite verse. I'm not surprised because he had this, he had this motive for his life, and he tried to pass that onto his, onto his sons. Of course, the Lord called them, you understand, but they, they're, they're, they're bent to yield to the Lord's call came from their father. Praise God for that. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost, to seek them because they were gone astray, to seek them because they were lost. Uh, if we were not lost, we would not need seeking. But the Lord Jesus, because we were lost, and the Lord Jesus, because the world is lost, he comes seeking them. He's always seeking them to save them. And the word save is to deliver them, to keep them from the destruction that is coming. See, not only are those who are lost in this world, unsaved in this world, unbelievers in this world, lost to the point that they're away from the fold, they're away from God's care for their life, they're away from fellowship with him, but they're on their way to destruction. 
They're on the broad path that leads to, to destruction. And God said, uh, Jesus said, I'm here not just to seek them, but to save them, to deliver them from that. He was unrelenting in his ministry. He said, I must abide at thy house in verse 5. This is what has to happen. I need to do this. I need to abide at thy house. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well. Or regarding her, he said, I must needs go through Samaria. Remember that? Why? Because he was seeking that woman. He was seeking that woman and he was seeking all who she would come in contact with later on who would be saved. God wants us to seek the souls. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You can turn there. 2 Corinthians 5. And verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all, one, then we're all dead. For all areas are li of our lives, but especially for this area of soul winning, the love of Christ needs to constrain us. Is it the love of Christ that drives us to live a Christian life? It is, a, is it the love of Christ that drives us to unity in Christ's body? Is it the love of Christ that drives us to give the gospel to a poor, lost, and dying soul? If we refuse to do that, then it could be said we don't have the love of Christ constraining us. If that's not on our heart, if that's not on our mind, then chances are we have the love of ourself constraining us. That which will benefit me. I'm doing these righteous things in my life because I enjoy them or because I can see the earthly benefit from them or because it's what I've always done. Maybe it's one of those reasons, but if the love of Christ constrains me, then my focus was going to be on giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that your focus? Is that my focus tonight? This is where we need to be. I like verse 9. Just, this is just a, a side point as we close. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. The idea there is that he was already a son of Abraham and that he was born a son of Abraham. But now, because of faith in Christ, he was really a son of Abraham. Romans chapter 9, Galatians chapter 3, bear this out. Uh, not all that are of Israel are really of Israel until they trust in Christ. They, they that are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, says Galatians chapter 3. Whether we were born Israelites or not, we can all be Israelites. We all, can all be sons of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. Because it's faith in Jesus Christ that justifies us. It's faith that justifies us. Have we trusted in Jesus Christ? This man did. And he demonstrated that by that by his fruit. Here all these accusations are going around about this man being a sinner. And he stood up and he said, the half of my goods I give to feed the poor. If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation or by defrauding, I restore him fourfold. So here was a man, unlike the Pharisees who were priding themselves on the little that they did that was by the law, he was willing to go beyond what was lawful just to demonstrate that he had trusted in Christ. Here were real fruits meet for repentance. He said, I'm going to give back fourfold. He said, I'm going to give to the, I'm going to give half my goods to feed the poor. So how many of you would like to do that tonight? Half of your uh, value, just donate that to the poor. That'd be a hard thing to do. Say, well, he was rich. Sometimes it's harder for the rich people to do that than it is for the poor people to do that. Here was a man who was willing to do that because he recognized his life had to be changed and his life was changed by his, this meeting with the Lord Jesus. So that's a, an encouragement for us tonight. When we give the gospel, we should have this unassuming, humble mindset of the Lord Jesus. We should have this unselfish mindset of the Lord Jesus. And we should have this un, unrelenting desire for the lost world that Jesus had. But we should be encouraged that God is saving people. Even people who seem like they're beyond salvation and don't need it and don't want it, like Zacchaeus. They thought he didn't deserve it. They thought he wouldn't want it. And, and uh, from our perspective, we look at those who are wealthy in this world and we say they don't need it. We, well, we say that their perspective will be that they don't need it. But they do. And they can be saved. We need to take the opportunities that God has placed in front of us to give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ.